Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, and while you turn there, I want to start off and introduce our, our time together today, today by asking you kind of a, a difficult introspective question. Okay? What is one word you would use to describe your relationship with God? What is one word, and I, I won't embarrass you and ask you to say it out loud, but what is one word you would use to describe your relationship with God? Is it thriving? Or maybe it's just surviving? Maybe it's tiring? Maybe for, for some of us, it, it's honestly, it's, it's non-existent. Maybe for some of you, your, your relationship with God is extraordinary. Maybe it's just kind of meh. Is it stagnant? Is it satisfying? Or maybe is it unsatisfying? And I think it's important for us to, to understand that not only our, our current relationship with God, but also we need to understand what God desires for our relationship with him. This is what he says in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they, you, me, may have life and have it abundantly. Abundantly means remarkable, extraordinary, and overflowing. But I, I have to ask, does that describe your relationship with the Lord today? Many times, if, if, if I'm honest... It doesn't, right? And I've been uh, a follower of Jesus. I was thinking about this this week, that I've been uh, a believer, a follower of Jesus for almost 30 years now. And there are times where, where this whole thing, if, if I'm really, really honest, feels kind of, mm, blah. I don't want that. There are times that I, I would not call my relationship with God remarkable or extraordinary. And if I'm really honest, growing spiritually maturing can feel like a chore that I don't have time for or if I'm really honest that I don't even really desire at times sure yes I, I want to grow in my relationship with God but but sometimes life is busy right work is busy our kids schedules are crazy this past Thursday we had three baseball games like all at the same time how do you manage that okay and when they're not playing baseball my kids sometimes get on my nerves. That never happens to you guys, right? All the time, right? Sometimes stress in our lives is really high. Sometimes the, the worries about money are really high. Sometimes we have just too many errands to run. Sometimes the lions are playing, and I desperately just want to nap. Right? Anyone else relate? That sometimes when we think about our spiritual life, we think about uh, wh what God wants to grow in us, it just seems like a lot. It seems exhausting. And on one occasion in the gospel, Jesus is, is teaching his disciples and the, his other followers. And they didn't obviously have the same 21st century problems like us. But they were burdened by the demands of life. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says to them. This is from Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites all who labor, all who struggle, all who experience the everyday burdens of life to take up his yoke. And now practically speaking, a, a yoke, many of you know, was a, a piece of wood placed on animals that they would use to steer and carry the burden of the work. But as a teacher, Jesus is not referring to a piece of wood. The yoke was a common expression in the first century that referred to a rabbi's way of reading scripture. But it was even more than that. It was a rabbi's teaching about how to live a life worth living you could say that that a rabbi's yoke was his way of shouldering the weight of life all those things that keep us preoccupied all those things that stress us out give us anxiety or or, or cause our lives to be messy eugene peterson who, who wrote uh, a popular paraphrase of the bible called the message he wrote it this way i love this 
Are you tired, worn out, burned out by religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And you know what that sounds like? It sounds like a remarkable, extraordinary, and abundant life. And that's what the, the life that Jesus wants to give to us. He calls us to it as long as we are willing to take hold of it. Today we're, we're beginning a, a six-week week series that the pastors and staff of all three Hope campuses have been praying is a game changer for all our people. And it's called Rhythms of Grace, Practicing the Way of Jesus in Everyday Life. And honestly, this is a series that's been on my heart for a really long time because when, when I first became a believer, I wanted to grow. I wanted to grow my relationship with God, but I had no idea how to do it. I had no idea. And so actually, I, I knew a uh, part of that was I, I knew that I was supposed to read the Bible. I knew that I was supposed to grow in my knowledge and understanding of the Bible. And so I read it every single day. And I still, to this day, I have a Bible that I literally underlined everything I read. Everything. So the entire Bible is just underlined. That's dumb. Okay? But I didn't know how to study the Word of God. I didn't know how to grow. And I didn't learn it until I went to Bible college. But you shouldn't have to go to Bible college to learn how to study the Bible. You shouldn't have to go to Bible college to learn how to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you have a desire to grow, but you don't know how. And even what the Bible taught challenged me to grow, but I still didn't know. There was a disconnect between what I was experiencing in life and the easy yoke that that Jesus promised. There's something about the way that I was following Jesus that was not producing the level of transformation that I knew was possible. And many years ago, I was introduced to an author that's just an incredible gift to the kingdom of God. He puts it so simply, yet powerfully. This is from Dallas Willard. It says, The secret of easy yoke involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. There's a, there's a movement several years ago where people would, would wear these bracelets, right? WWJD. Remember that? What would Jesus do? I had like 54 different colors of the same bracelet. But this is what it's getting at. Meaning asking yourself in every phase of life, what would, what would Jesus do in this situation? And this leads to a, a key understanding we must grasp as we, as we move through this series. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Let me read that again. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. This is how we grow. By arranging our lives around these rhythms or practices that that Jesus engaged in to be in constant fellowship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we begin this series, Rhythms of Grace, this is my prayer, that every believer would would walk away inspired with, with a vision for what is possible in our lives as spiritual formation takes place, but also that you would walk away with a desire in some practical way to live all these things out, to really live like Jesus. So here's what this looks like. We're going to teach through five specific practices of Jesus with the goal of implementing them as a part of our lives. Now, there are many, many more that we could cover, but we're just going to do five. And the goal is to abide with Christ, to grow more deeply in our walk with him and experience more and more abundant life, to take on his easy yoke. So for as far as an introduction for today goes, this is what I want to cover. Sermon in a sentence. It is impossible to grow spiritually apart from God's grace. But by his grace, God gives us everything we need to train for the growth he wants in us. It is possible to grow in your relationship with God. 
And to start off, we need to lay some theological groundwork so that, that our relationship with God, I love that Tom said this, doesn't become like a checklist of things that you just need to do, that you, you just need to, to do the right thing and you'll have a perfect life. Because don't, we don't want it to be that. Because there are times in our lives where we are all guilty of kind of having bumper sticker theology. You know what I'm talking about? Or like coffee cup theology where you go to a Christian bookstore and you, you see all the signs that are painted on there. And these are, these are solid truths that can be helpful, but often they're a, they're a little cheesy, right? And also sometimes they're removed from context. So, for example, let go and let God. Has ever heard that one? True, right? But when you're driving a car, don't let go, okay? Can't remove those from context. My mom used to say this one all the time. Wash your hands and say your prayers. Anyone else say that? My mom said that to us all the time, and that's true, but that's not all that's needed for life. I asked my wife if she could think of one, and this is what she came up with. Uh, Well-behaved women rarely make history. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. And I was like, I, th I think you kind of missed it. Sometimes we even just take a passage of Scripture and remove it from context, Right? Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope and that's true but we can't remove it from context but there's one <coughs> excuse me uh, another one that, that has gained some ground in recent in past years it's this Christianity is not a religion of do it's a relationship of done. Has heard that one before? And it's true, and, and that'll preach, right? We can preach that, but it is true, but it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about salvation, absolutely, it is finished. When God saved you, he declared you righteous and holy. It's done. If you're, this is the doctrine of justification. Romans 5, 1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you need to hear just this. You are not God, God's enemy. He loves you. And he's not waiting for some future version of you to love. He loves you right now. And when you repented of your sins, surrendered the control of your life to him, and received salvation, it was done. As a follower of Jesus, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more or love you less. There is no discipline, no practice, there's no sin, no struggle that can happen in the life of a Jesus follower that decreases or increases God's love and affection for you. It's done. He gave his son for you. He loves you. And he knew what he was buying when he purchased your freedom on the cross. And for some of you, that, that is the only part of this sermon that you need to hear right now, to be honest. The enemy has been bullying you with lies, trying to tell you that somehow you have out God's love and grace. And that's just simply not the case. God loves you. Listen, beloved, there was, there was nothing you did to earn his love, and there's nothing you can do to lose it. It is done, finished. When it comes to salvation, there, there is nothing to do because it has already been done. Yes and amen. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less, but there are things you and I can do to increase our love and affection for Jesus. There are things that we can do to love God more. Yes, our salvation is accomplished, but our sanctification is is not done. And I pray that, that in 10 years, there goes Mason's music again. It's just going to, I'm just going to take this off here. Because that's going to fall down page by page and distract every single one of us. So I pray that in 10 years, I love God more. I cherish time with him more. I love his word more. And I love his people more. And if, if that's the case, if that's what I want, I have to put the work in. This is the growth that God wants for his children. Second Peter 3.18 says this, But grow 
in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and, and to the day of eternity. We don't grow into people who are more loved by God, but we do grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. And therefore, enabling us to experience more of him and to tap into that remarkable, extraordinary, abundant life that Jesus wants to give to us. So the question now is then, how do we grow? How do we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Today I want to talk about two principles of spiritual formation. Here's number one. God is responsible for spiritual formation. God is responsible for spiritual formation. It is impossible to grow spiritually apart from God's grace. It's impossible. Jesus says, this is the, the word we read earlier from John 15. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We can experience no good, no growth, nothing of value apart from Jesus. This is one of those verses we know, but do we actually believe it? Do we actually believe it in our souls? Because if I'm honest, I, I think a little too much of myself at times. I believe I am capable of some pretty great things. The other day, I smoked a brisket that would make you weep and drool all at the same time. Actually, I'm not very good at it, so. But, but theologically, biblically, what Jesus is saying here in, in John chapter 15 is that I can do nothing apart from God. Even those insignificant <coughs> skills and abilities that we have are from God. They are his gifts to us. Abide, when he talks about abiding in this verse, it's an imperative, meaning it's, it's a command. Jesus is commanding us. He calls us to cling to him, to grab on to him. And what he does through us as, as we do that is he bears much fruit. Fruit is the life of the vine being pressed out through the branches. As I abide in Christ, as I remain in him, cling to him, my life starts to produce fruit that looks like Jesus. One pastor said it this way, if it says, we do not produce fruit. It is the fruit of the Spirit within us. We simply bear it. Thus, we become channels for God's grace. We bear the fruit. When we abide, God provides the growth. But how do we abide? And simply put, we, we have to intend to do it. It won't happen unless you and I are intentional about, about growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the second spiritual formation principle is this. Yes, God is responsible for the spiritual transformation, but you are responsible for spiritual training. You are responsible. Apart from God's grace, we can do nothing, but by his grace, we can do all things, including being intentional to train for the growth we and God desires in, in the life of every single believer. Grace doesn't make us passive. It makes us alive and active. And we will never passively find what we do not actively pursue. It, it's not like some t somehow this is just going to, we're going to absorb this through osmosis. It's not like if you replaced your pillow in your bed with, with a Bible that you would somehow know more. We have to be intentional. We have to be active in pursuing a relationship with God. And it, it, it breaks my heart to see sometimes that in churches, people that have, that have grown up in church their entire lives have, have grown stagnant in their relationship with God. That people who should be spiritual leaders, people that, that should be leading others towards Jesus are just stuck in the same place they were 30 years ago. And I know I'm guilty of it sometimes, but that has to break God's heart because he knows there's more. There's so much more. There's so much more abundance. There, there, there's so much more to show and live. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the, is the book of 1 Timothy. This is Paul, a seasoned veteran, writing to 
a young pastor who is leading a church in the city of Ephesus. And Timothy has no idea what he's doing. Does it sound familiar? Just like me. No idea. But he writes this to Timothy. He says, Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. The word train is gymnasia, where we get the word gymnasium. It's in the present active imperative tense, which means it's to train like a Greek athlete, to continually do it. Have you ever watched a high-level athlete train? I had the privilege of running track for a few years in high school, and we had uh, a young man. His name was Dathan Ritzenheim, and he uh, broke the record for the fastest mile ever run by a high school student. And you notice something about him that nothing happened on accident. Nothing happened uh, passively. It all took work for him, and he worked harder than any person I had ever seen on the track. He outran everybody. He stayed later. He came earlier to work, to work, to work. And Paul and the other writers of the New Testament, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, make it clear. We do not work for our salvation, but we do work out our salvation. We do work. We have to. Meaning that Scripture is very comfortable with the idea of grace-fueled grit striving, toil, work, with the end goal of growth in Christ by the power of the Spirit. And as followers of Jesus, we don't strive for grace, we strive by grace. Ephesians 2, very familiar passage, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, grace and grit are not opposed to each other. Grace and work are not opposed to each other. They actually work together. And when it says that we should walk in them, There's some intentionality that needs to happen in our lives as Christians. You can't strive to earn what is impossible to earn, and that's grace. You can't earn that. But we can strive by grace that we have already received from the Father. And striving by grace is how we grow. Dallas Willard again says this, Grace is opposed to earning. It is not opposed to effort. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. And as we draw to the close of of this this first lesson, this introduction, I want to give you a glimpse of how we do this. We will continue to unpack this over the next five weeks, but how do we grow in the grace and knowledge and the experience, the abundant life that Christ wants for us? How do we do, how do we take on the easy yoke of Jesus? It's by imitating Jesus his lifestyle by practicing the way of Jesus and it's crucial to remember for us that these rhythms and practices are not the goal my goal is not to have a bunch of people in our church that just check the boxes every week but the the purpose of those rhythms the practices is to get to the goal the goal is more love more affection more desire for Christ. And throughout all church history, people have talked about these practices or these rhythms, and they've, they call them disciplines. And we kind of hate that word, discipline. But discipline in the Bible simply means training the body for future effectiveness. Meaning discipline is an activity that I do by direct or intentional effort that will eventually enable me to do That which currently I cannot do by direct effort. And let me explain that. If I want to learn to cook, I don't start by preparing a banquet for a thousand people, right? I start by making macaroni and cheese. 
We do things, small, incremental things, so that someday, once I get really good at macaroni and cheese, maybe I try peanut butter and jelly. Maybe that's backwards. But we grow in the ability. We start small, sm small movements. When I was a, a few years ago, I wanted to learn how to roast coffee. I wanted to learn how to make my own brand of coffee, and so I started doing research, and while I was doing it, uh, one of the guys in our church is like, hey, uh, I hear you're starting to roast coffee. And I go, yeah, I'm starting to learn the, learn the process. He goes, would you want to provide all the coffee for our church functions? And I was like, absolutely not. I, he goes, why not? I go, I've, I've, I've roasted like one quarter pound so far. I go, it would be foolish for me to take on a church of 1,600 people and provide the coffee. Do you know how much they would hate me if I messed that up? And so you start small. You start by roasting a quarter pound at a time, and then half a pound, and then a pound, and then I started giving it to my friends to evaluate. Then I started selling it to some friends, to some family members, and then I started selling it online. And But I first had to learn the practice, the small incremental things, the disciplines of roasting coffee. And through discipline, I learned the ability to make an amazing bag of coffee. In the Bible... The human author's favorite illustration of this idea is athletics. So sorry for those of you who hate sports, but in this time, in this time in history, the Olympic Games had already existed, and they were very, very aware of the training that took place in competitive environments. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says this, Do you know, not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body, and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. No one has ever said, if you want to be a great athlete, start by benching 300 pounds or start by running a sub four-minute mile. No one has ever said, if, if you want to be a great musician, start with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. No, instead, we instruct young athletes or artists to enter a certain kind of life, one that involves deep association with, with people, qualified people that can teach them how to manage their time, how to manage their diet, how to manage their activity and their mind for the desired results. It's about progress. It's about growth. And this is how we become people who can do things we can't currently do. We don't get there. We don't get where we want by simply trying harder. We get there we get where we want by training wiser. So how do we get there? We start small. If you, don't, if you want to deadlift 400 pounds, you don't start with 400 pounds on the bar. Jerry Bridges says this, you and I are responsible to train ourselves. We are dependent upon God for his divine enablement, but we are responsible. We are not passive in this process. We have work that we are supposed to do. So what's our part? That's what we're going to be figuring out over the next five weeks. But simply put, we must abide, we must practice. It's called discipline. But spiritual discipline is different than physical discipline. We are not operating, thank God, from the strength that we possess in our own bodies, but by the strength of the Spirit. We started off today by stating this. It is impossible to grow spiritually apart from God's grace, but by his grace, God gives us everything we need to train for the growth he wants for us. So who you are today is built on what you've practiced, the rhythms of life that you have repeated over and over again have produced who you are today. But who do you want to be tomorrow? Who do you want to be next year, in five years, in, in 10 years? 
How do you want to be remembered at the end of your life? What cut type of legacy do you want to leave for your kids, for your grandkids, for the people who know you? We can become that type of person as we abide in Christ, as we strive with grace-fueled grit and train for godliness in the rhythms of grace. One author I read this week said, people often complain that they are not who they should be, but they take no action to change. I don't want to be that type of person. So here's the, the ask of you. Commit to this series. Meaning, show up when you can. For the next five weeks, show up when you can. And if you can't show up, if you have vacations, if you have stuff planned, that's fine. But that's why we put these messages online. So if you can, show up. When you can't, listen online and then do something about it. We have the tendency to, to come to church on, on Sunday mornings and, and, and listen, and listen well, and have every intention of, of living a better life. But a lot of times... Just like my kids, it goes in one ear, right out the other one, right? As soon as you walk out that door, there's going to be, going to be a million distractions that hit, hit us in the face. So commit to learning, to listening, and then doing something about it. As we close today, I, I want to give you some time. We've been, we've been doing this more often to reflect and to ask. I'm going to ask Ethan in just a minute to, to turn on some music so you can have a couple of minutes to ask God, okay, where in my life have I been failing to abide in Christ? Where in my life have I been missing the mark? And then by God's grace, ask the Lord to help you in those things because he's faithful and just to do so. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So take a few minutes. Ethan, if you want to turn on some music there, and then I'll come up and close this out in prayer.